Welcome to the Journal.ie's The Explainer. This is a bonus episode brought to you by our investigative platform Noteworthy, where we carry out journalistic projects based on ideas sent to us by the public. I'm Susan Daly, and just before Christmas at Noteworthy, we published an article by investigative reporter Maria Delaney, which examined the impact that a lack of public funding for fertility treatment is having on people in Ireland. Today, I am joined by Maria, and this episode will also feature the voices of a number of people who spoke to her about their experiences with this issue. Maria, thanks for joining me today. Happy New Year to you. And before we begin, let's become familiar with some of the phrases that we're going to hear throughout this episode. Uh, Firstly, I'm going to ask you what sounds like a simple question, but what do we mean by infertility? Thanks for having me on, Susan. So infertility, it's a condition that the World Health Organization classifies as a disease of the reproductive system. And around one in six heterosexual couples in Ireland may experience infertility, according to the HSE. And there are many possible causes um, with both male and female factors account for 40% each. So that's evenly split and no cause is ever found in the final 20% of cases. It affects so many people and those stats bear that out. So when you're immersed in that, I think people use terms that become very familiar to them for the purpose of our audience today. Could you tell us about the main terms we should know about when it comes to fertility treatment? So most people would be familiar with IVF, which is in vitro fertilization, but that's actually a series of procedures. So it involves the collection of mature eggs from ovaries, the fertilization by sperm in a lab, and then the fertilized egg or embryo is then transferred into a uterus. And then if more than one embryo is collected, they're often frozen for later use. And another is in intrauterine insemination or IUI, And that's where sperm is washed and concentrated and placed directly into the uterus around ovulation. So that's a slightly different procedure that doesn't involve embryo outside a lab. And then another one is assisted human reproduction. And that's the Irish term that the Irish law uses for these and similar fertility treatments. And um, within this group, so the assisted human reproduction, these aren't actually provided by the HSE, but provided by private clinics in Ireland. Maria, one of the facts that struck me in your article, and people can find that on noteworthy.ie called Funding Fertility, was that Ireland continues to be the only country in the European Union where fertility treatments such as IVF are not publicly funded. How do we compare it to our European neighbours? Well, actually, a few days before um, the article was published, the European Atlas of Fertility Treatment Policies was launched by in the European Parliament by Francis Fitzgerald, um, MEP for Ireland. And it found that um, Ireland is among the worst in Europe when it came to fertility treatment provision. And it was joined by Albania, Armenia and Poland in the exceptionally poor group at the bottom of the table. And so we're not faring well when it comes to our European neighbours. That's really poor. And it is fair to say that the state has recognised how poorly Ireland is performing in this area because when Leo Varadkar was Minister for Health back in 2016, he announced public funding for fertility treatment. So how has that progressed? Well, we reported um, is actually this time last year that there is no timeline for funding of IVF as the Department of Health is linking this funding to the long-awaited Assisted Human Reproduction Bill. And that bill is now delayed due to issues with international surrogacy, so it's not anything to do with the public funding of IVF, but um, it's a separate kind of legal issue. And um, in this particular report before Christmas, the D- Department of Health told us that no decisions have been finalised on location of these services, so that's IVF and similar services, treatment packages, the level of resources required, or the total cost of providing publicly funded assisted human reproduction services. So there's very little done there. And then the rolling out of phase one, so of the model of care for infertility. So that's um, phase one doesn't include IVF and that includes regional fertility hubs. And that'll um, manage around 50 to 70% of patients with infertility. So that's people who perhaps don't have to go on to do IVF or IUI or those particular services. Um, So that's being rolled out at the moment. However, phase two, which includes IVF, will not commence until such time, according to the Department of Health, 
as infertility services on a secondary level. So that's the regional fertility hubs have been developed across the country and required resources have been allocated and that the legislation has commenced. So there's a few things there that need to be put in place before IVF is publicly funded. There's a bit of a catch-22 going on there with which comes first and what needs to go first. And phase two involves directing IVF and similar tre- treatments through the public system, Maria, but how is that currently coping? Well, I suppose that's the thing, like uh, as with the rest of the health service in Ireland, like consultants are already under pressure and um, like over 30,000 adults are actually waiting to see a gynecologist at the moment and over 6,000 are waiting over a year. And I spoke to Edwina Hayes and she recently went through chemotherapy and radiotherapy for breast cancer. And she's been waiting since June to see a gynecologist in the public system to find out if she's fertile after cancer treatment. And this would be something that you'd need to find out before going on to see if you need treatment. So she's still waiting for an appointment date and that's over six months later. And she's obviously finding this wait extremely frustrating and stressful. And here's a clip from when I spoke to Edwina before Christmas. Well, I'm just left in this abyss of nothingness of I don't know if I'm fertile or infertile. I don't know if I have even enough eggs left for treatment down the line because I had no option to do any of it before my cancer treatments. So we we'd no option to even see or look at what things were. And if Edwina finds out she does need something like IVF down the line, she will then have to pay for it. Maria, you spoke to a number of people who've recently gone through or are going through fertility treatment. And how was the lack of public funding impacting them? So everyone I spoke to, I spoke to a good few people um, who are currently going through it and they've spent at least €8,000. And some people, like I spoke to a woman called Amy Dunn and her partner, Sarah, and they spent close to €35,000 in less than two years. And that's the thing, the costs aren't always equal and some pay extra for services, such as in the case of Amy, um, sperm donation and reciprocal IVF. So that's the case where the egg of one woman is fertilised and transferred into their partner. So again, it's not always equal across the board. I also spoke to Rita O'Mara and she started treatment at um, age 30, soon after getting married to her husband, Shane. And they have spent almost 10,000 euro in the past two years. And she's downgraded her car, gave up extra expenses such as holidays. And um, they've gone through um, a cycle of IVF and they have a number of embryos in storage. But once they run out, she doesn't feel that she could financially or mentally go on to do another cycle of IVF. Here's a clip from when I spoke to Rita. So here we are, um, two years down the line, we have almost 10,000 euros spent and we don't have a baby. It's disappointing because it is a medical, you know, it's not my fault that I can't or we can't, you know, it's not like I've done anything to make this happen. So I I just feel that like you kind of are being punished when you haven't, you haven't done anything to cause this, do you know, that kind of way. It was evident from the people you spoke to that there was much frustration about infertility not being treated like other medical conditions, Maria. Then there were even more complicated cases of people you spoke to whose fertility was being impacted by other underlying medical conditions and they were being treated for those underlying conditions in the public system, but then having to go private for resultant fertility issues? Yes, like a number of women I spoke to actually had endometriosis and this is a condition where tissue that normally lines the inside of the uterus or the womb grows outside it and also unfortunately it causes difficulty when getting pregnant. So two people I spoke to were actually being treated in the public system for endometriosis um, under a consultant and then they transferred with the same consultant to a private clinic for fertility treatment. And one of these was Sarah Fennessy, and and she was told just after buying a house and turning 30 that if she wanted a child, she'd have to start then and there. So she obviously had a a big mortgage um, on her hands as well. And she and her partner, Dean, spent over 15,500 across treatments in the past two years and unfortunately haven't been successful to date. And she's still trying to pay everything back. Like our panic now is to get married. So if we want to go for another round of IVF, we have the wedding out of the way. So it 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 puts pressure on every element of your life. And we make the decision, if we're going for IVF in the next two years, we can't get married. There's two lives that we want to live. We we want to, you know, 
have the big celebration. We want to live that married life and we want to do it with children. And our hands are completely tired. You know, IVF it shouldn't be for the rich. You know, having a family shouldn't be for the rich. It's it's not fair. And I, there needs to be more support from government because it would have made my life so much easier. And when you talk about going through IVF, everything's affected. Your mental health, you know, if you're stressed in any way, it does have an impact on your body. The financial stress of that is not healthy. And our government is doing that to us. Now, the financial stress Sarah mentions there carries across everyone you interviewed, Maria. What kind of sacrifices are people making to pay for private treatment? Well, one of the interesting things I found is that there is a huge crossover with the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. And actually, a number of people I spoke to were using their housing deposits on fertility treatment because they found out, I suppose, perhaps just after getting married, that they could possibly have fertility issues and then had to use the money they had saved for a house on this treatment. And one of these was Kim Moore. So Kim and her husband, Simon, have spent around 30,000 on fertility treatment since getting married in 2015. And in her early 30s, when she started treatment, she had her son Marvin then two years later and Megan uh, following two years later. But they actually spent their initial house deposit on IVF and subsequently managed to buy a house, but only with the help of family. So paying for treatment delayed this. So they had a number of embryos um, from their last IVF cycle and they were going through their final transfer procedure with their final embryo when I spoke to Kim. Um, unfortunately, that embryo that Kim talks about didn't work out in the end. For anybody going through it, I would always just say like the prices that the clinics put up as the original price is always extras be it extra for the medication, then your initial consultation, your uh, certain bloods, all in total we've probably spent between the two full rounds on the transfers and everything we've spent probably 30 grand. And, you know, we're, I'm lucky, myself and my husband have two decent jobs, but like everybody, we have a house, we have a mortgage, we have two little kids, you know, just your own living expenses. It, 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 it's stretched us if, please God, this one embryo takes, but to have to go again, you know, you'd be borrowing, you'd be looking for whatever help you can get, and you, you can't switch off the urine to want a baby. And it's really, it just kills me the fact that, you know, it's all, you could you can afford to have the child, but you just can't, maybe necessarily can't afford to get pregnant. I want to ask you about something Kim mentions with regards to additional costs in private clinics. Maria, you examine the profits being made by these clinics in Ireland. Perfectly legal, they're providing a service. But what did you find about how they're getting on? So I suppose the first thing is that uh, the number of treatment cycles um, for treatments like IVF have almost tripled in the past 12 years. And that's something that private clinics have told us as well, that they found an increase in people interested or contacting them about cycles. And over 11,000 treatment cycles were actually done annually before the pandemic. And this was a bit lower than during the pandemic because there was a break where people weren't actually able to do them. But a number of companies that own private fertility clinics reported profits in the millions. And, and these included Vitrus Health Limited, who owns Sims IVF, Repromed Holdings Limited and First IVF, and they reported trading profits of well over 1 million euro each in their latest financial statements. And some are also advertising add-ons, um, and these are uh, treatments that you can get in addition to, I suppose, the normal state of play for IVF or the normal treatments. And these add-ons are listed as having no or conflicting evidence from randomized controlled trials of improving the chances of having a baby for most fertility treatments. And they've been looked at by the UK regulator. OK, I dare I ask, they've been looked at by the UK regulator. What is being done about these add-ons in Ireland? Are we looking at them? Here, there's actually no assisted human reproduction law and there's no regulator and a lack of legislation leaves Ireland a wild west when it comes to treatment provision, according to Francis Fitzgerald, our um, Ireland MEP. And there is um, something coming in. So the assisted human reproduction bill, which I've mentioned before, and that will establish the assistant human reproduction regulatory authority, which the Department of Health told us will help to ensure that these practices are conducted in a more consistent and standardised way and with necessary oversight. However, um, I suppose when it comes to 
having to wait for this bill to come in for funding of IVF. A lot of experts we spoke to, including Dublin-based GP Dr. Michelle Rogers, who conducted thesis research on the state funding of fertility treatment. So she says that the government is using the legislation as an excuse to delay funding of IVF. And here she talks about the impact of lack of funding on patients. There's huge impacts on the person or couple. And so those impacts they can see in terms of psychological impacts for them, relationship impacts, cultural, you know, for the doctor, where you can't actually, you know, there are treatments available, but you can't access them for those people. It's hard to rationalise. And that's why I think people are very aware that IVF and all those services are so expensive. So that's why I see fewer and fewer people who don't have the money, they tend not to come. They're not even even trying to access help with their fertility. Yeah, I think they're they're doing other routes, and I would say it's um, traveling, going out of the country because they can get the services for cheaper in other countries. Okay, Marie. Well, let's look a little bit towards the future then. What does the new government model, presuming it comes in, mean for these private clinics? Well, from researching um, into the UK and what it looks like there, it looks like it's here to stay. And even though uh, they have a public system through the NHS, over two thirds of treatment cycles were actually self-funded through private clinics in 2019. So they have a public model, but availability is often dependent on location and leading to what they call a postcode lottery. And clinical director of Marian Fertility, Professor Mary Wingfield, told me that in most countries which have public funding, there's also a need for private clinics, as well as most countries having some restrictions on access. So she said that sadly, there will be a need for private care in this area going forward. And though with a lack of timeline for the model, many I spoke to called on interim measures, um, many of the patients I spoke to, including and many of the experts, and that included Francis Fitzgerald, who said that Minister Stephen Donnelly, so the Minister for Health, could probably go ahead with some funding in the interim. Thanks, Maria, for that. The impact of being the only country in the EU in which fertility treatment is not catered for under the public health system is so clear from your research and those prospective parents you spoke to being put under severe emotional and financial stress. And I want to say a special thanks from all of us at Noteworthy to those women who allowed us to feature their experiences and voices on today's podcast. You have been listening to this bonus episode of The Explainer, brought to you by Noteworthy.ie. It was produced by Laura Byrne. If you want to learn more about our work at Noteworthy and how we source our stories from you, our readers and listeners, head to our site at Noteworthy.ie and sign up to our newsletter, which will give you an insider look at our latest investigations. You can do that by visiting Noteworthy.ie forward slash newsletter. Thanks for having us and we'll see you next time.